All right. Hmm. Starting Good morning, call. everyone. This is the latest of AQR's uh, webinar series, Hub webinar series, and it's a really exciting one. So it's called The Making of History, and we have a, an illustrious panel, which includes Claire Langhammer, who I hope I pronounced it properly, um, the academic, academic on board, Phyllis McFarlane, um, and Peter Bartram, both of the Archive of Social Market Research. Um, so I'm going to ask you one by one to introduce yourselves, rather than have me do the legwork. So Claire, if you wouldn't mind um, kicking off, and I would say that Claire, we heard her last week on the Today programme talking about mass ops, which I'm very keen for you to enlighten us about. Um, she tells us she was on the World Service as well over the weekend, so she's a gad about. But anyway, Claire, if you'd like to kick off. Luella, you're very quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Luella. Um, as well as being um, a gadabout, which I am, I am also Professor of Modern British History at Sussex University and I'm a trustee of the Mass Observation Archive. Lovely. Can you tell us a little bit about the Mass Observation Archive? Mass Observation Archive was founded in 1937 to do an anthropology of ourselves. Uh, lots of social research involved, operated across the middle of the 20th century and then was reintroduced from 1981 and, and continues to gather material to this day. Lovely. Phyllis, kick off. Yeah, and, and it is a very important source, much used by historians and very qualitative, actually. Um, so I'm Phyllis McFarlane. Um, I, uh, I used to be MD of NOP, uh, MG of KNOP, and I'm currently looking after content at the... Uh, AMSR, the Archive of Market and Social Research. But you're quite all right, Luella, getting the social and the market the wrong way around. I, I do Sorry. that all the time. I know it's quite all right. So I'm here to, to tell you about the archive and, um, and hopefully to get you to contribute towards it. Peter. Uh, hi. Um, well, I've been uh, around the market research and social research industry for many more years than I care to say. Um, with uh, I ran a Harris Poll originally, I with the NOP, uh, with American Express, and with the Sunday Times, um, and um, more recently I'm one of the trustees of the archive, um, and um, I have been looking at ways in which identifying content um, that that, uh, have, that that are now up actually up on the the the, the website. Um, itself, 54 blogs and stories on all sorts of cornucopia of information on various markets, all of which I hope will enhance the authority of anyone looking at the archive. And he forgot to say that he's recently published a book it's called The Life and Research. So uh, go out and buy, please. Uh, you're encouraged to buy that. Um, I, it was partly put together by a collection of qualitative researchers who gave us their extremely funny stories from the past, things that can go wrong, things that can go right. Um, and so you'll find um, it's a bit amusing and, and uh, informative. And before I kick off, I'd just like to say that um, we have got a few questions in already, but if you'd like to uh, ask questions, um, please, you know, go ahead and make them available, if you would, to, to both the panel and co-participants. That would be great. So I think we'll kick off, really, Phyllis, with you. Um, we heard about the archive in the early days, um, but that's about five years back, is it? So where are you at now? Well, um, we've been around, as you say, uh, for five years, and we've been focusing very much on, on collecting heritage material. Um, that is the basically the paper reports that um, that were very much in danger of being destroyed as agencies uh, got bought up and moved premises. And I mean, we at NOP used to keep all our old reports in garages all over London, and uh, every now and then one would get flooded, and we'd have to decide whether to keep it or not. So we lost a fair amount of stuff. But anyway, we built it up over those four or five years. A lot of help from Peter. Um, to the point where we felt that it really is viable. And I've been spending the last six months um, really defining the user base. Um, and uh, Paddy Barwan, uh, Bar 
Wise, our, our chairman, Professor Paddy Barwise, our chairman, um, suggested that modern British historians would be a, uh, a good user of, of, of the database. I must admit, I was, I was slightly, I was slightly um, skeptical about this, um, but I've been talking to lovely people like Claire and deciding I wished I'd been a, a modern British historian in my day, but, um, but anyway, I, I got into market research instead. Um, and we've been looking at materials that she can use in, for her research and her students can use and for her teaching. And one of the most interesting thing I think is that contrary to what I thought, she's actually more interested in the qualitative research than she is in the quantitative research, which was, uh, as I say, was quite a surprise to me. They, historians see, see market research from a different point of view from those of us who have been in the industry forever. Um, and so we're, we're building that user base. And today we want to, to talk to uh, AQR about how modern British historians are using uh, what we've got in the archive and how perhaps they can help us going forward. So Claire, can you tell us what a professor of modern British history does and what, what gets you excited about it? And also where AMSR fits in? Hey. So, you know, I split my time between um, admin, which everybody does, but also, you know, research and teaching, both undergraduates and, and PhD students. Um, in terms of, of my everyday research, I'm, I work on 20th century Britain, but I'm particularly interested in the sort of social and cultural history of, of that time. And I'm at the moment doing a lot of work around the history of emotions and the history of feeling. So I'm very much interested in the qualitative and actually these sometimes an intangible, the difficult to get at. So I'm one of the reasons I'm so interested in this archive is that it presents a number of different ways of getting into and trying to get in a sort of sideways way um, access to people's feelings as well as their attitudes and their experiences. Um, the kinds of students that I have um, kind of you know, adopt similar approaches really, um, rather than necessarily burying down into one particular archive. Social and cultural historians do have a tendency to be gadflies and to, to gather around gathering bits of information from different places. Um, one of the particular interests for me in this archive is seeing how it sits alongside something like the Mass Observation Archive which although is often seen as something that was almost an altruistic organization of its time that just was interested in social research for its own sake, actually itself did some commercial research um, because it was employed by various organizations or had relationships, monetary relationships with newspapers to do particular pieces of research. Um, so I think in my, in my in my practice as a historian, I, I'm interested in this both for what it gives us in terms of source material, but also what it tells us about how researchers have done um, social and market research in the past and what that itself tells us about a particular moment. So have you noticed it making a difference in terms of what people do with the information that you come up with? Yeah, I think that people are historians um, are, are far perhaps more creative or have uh, or are asking questions that demand more creativity um, or more imagination or, or a more capacious more expansive approach to what an archive might be and what sources might be um, and so rather than just thinking right I'm going to toddle off to the to you know to the national archive and get my boxes out and that's going to be my thing um, to, to think around topics um, and to think with a period as well and to think what was actually going on in this period. You know, who was creating knowledge in this period? How were they going about that? Before moving on to Peter, I was excited to hear you talk about happiness because I know there's an awful lot of work going on in that area at the moment. Have you inputted to any of that? I did a did do some work on happiness a few years ago because mass observation did a um, had a 
competi ran a competition in Bolton in 1938 where they asked people um, what they what, what happiness was to them. Um, and it's a really beautiful, and it's interesting as well because it's a different methodology, the competition methodology. People submitting entries with the hope of winning a prize, but you can use that information, but they also pack a lot of autobiographical and philosophical information into those responses. Um, so with an economic history colleague, we did a, a study of that. We kind of tried to, he tried to quantify what the factors were that made people happy, who was happier where and at what time of the week and in what location and all of this stuff. Um, and it, it was, I mean, I loved it. I love, I love the happiness stuff. So I've been really interested to see the um, development of that as a field of study. Um, I over think the Rachel last Laws is doing a lot with it at the moment. Um, I just chip in, I know Noella, you like to keep us organized, but just a, a very little, um, example, I've been working with a PhD student and we were looking at concepts of luxury um, in, the, uh, in, in the 1960s and 70s. And she was talking about things being in guineas and um, you know, marketed to the, to the upper class and whatever. And just doing a search on the, on the term luxury, you've got all sorts of wonderful indications of, of what people thought of luxury. I mean, for example, a walnut whip was considered luxurious relative to a Mars bar, and and people a, a, a tin of smoke a tin of salmon was a luxury if your if your budget was being cut in 1973 four and you know and you can get away from the you know the horses and artworks and whatever being sold in guineas down to what it what, what luxury meant to real people who um, who didn't have a lot of money you know and champagne was just for that lot over there who had nothing to do with my life whatsoever, the upper classes. And, and you can get that out of verbatims very easily. It's not, um, you can get an awful lot. Sorry. I'm sure Roddy, if he's on, will come back at you on the Mars yeah. bar. Anyway, <laughs> Peter. Um, I mean, just illustrate the range of what's there on the archive by, by saying that, you know, there are 38 reports on pet and pet ownership. There are 30 reports on photography. 96 reports on race relations and immigration. And then there are also stories you'll find on the heading um, that, that we've done. We've got 54 stories just to illustrate what's possible to find in the archive on things like trends in convenience food, the rise of the sandwich culture, expectations of the NHS over the years, parental discipline. Is it right to um, use physical violence on your children? And if so, should the law intervene? Um, women in the workplace, obesity concerns. There's a whole lot of stories in there that are within the material on the archive. Are there a couple that you'd like to pick out? Because I know we were talking beforehand about breastfeeding mothers and you, you had a lovely story about uh, well, babies in China. That, that, those were more, I, I don't want to plug this book endlessly, but those are more in the illustrations in the book of things that can go right and wrong whilst doing your qualitative research just illustrations of that and also to show the quality that is provided by qualitative research in that we had a group with breastfeeding mothers um, which turned into a therapy session because many of them have low self-esteem in the period after the birth um, and it became a therapy session in which some of them were in tears and a whole lot of information came out which on an individual interview or on a more quantitative survey would never have come out. And it was simply for a bottle feed manufacturer who got a lot of insights on how to design their, not only their product, but also their promotion. And then internationally, um, in China, we had a, a, a convener running a focus group of young Chinese people who asked them to switch their phones off because the research was about a very confidential new drink that they were introducing and they didn't want information about this drink to get out of the room. Well, she left the room for a few minutes, at which point the young participants in China got out their other phones and started photographing the bottle like crazy. And she had forgotten that in China, young people actually have three or four phones sometimes, uh, and one phone is uh, telling them to switch one phone off is not enough. <laughs> Just a couple of examples. So we, we've heard about what use you can make of, of uh, any case studies that you bring in or any archive material. 
Um, what can people do if they want to give you any archive material, Phyllis? Oh, my favourite question, Luella. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to feed. Uh, I, um, well, um, first of all, we do want to mop up all the um, paper uh, material that people have got um, in their uh, attics uh, or whatever. So any, any what I call heritage research, we'd love to, we'd love to have. But we are now moving on to, to uh, obviously, questions of sustainability. We're, we're now moving on to collecting modern material. And um, we're starting off with some specialist collections. So we're interested in three, any research done on Brexit, any research done on diversity, equality, and uh, inclusion, or di diversity, inclusion, and equality it is, isn't it? Uh, and, and thirdly, any research done on COVID. So, re and, and following on that, I want to develop a, a stream, if you like, of modern research. For example, someone told me that um, um, EasyJet runs a community of, of its customers. And um, I just thought how wonderful that would be for Claire in 20 years time when she wants to, to look at what the attitudes to flying and going abroad and holidays were um, during the COVID period. Um, and I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to start collecting that information going forward. Now, I know that historically there have been, there are some objections uh, to it, such as client confidentiality. Um, and um, well, I think that's the main one, isn't it? And also what exactly we should, we should collect, what, what exact content we should have that will be useful to Claire and her colleagues in the future. Um, and I'd just like to say that I'm working on client confidential issues. I'm working with the Business Archives Council because what we found is that it's the archivists who are on our side and who understand that things need to preserve, be preserved and not necessarily the marketers. So I'm getting them on, on um, our side. Um, and also we can take research and embargo it for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years if you feel it is, it is rather sensitive and you don't want it to be revealed earlier. So I'm hoping in the Q&A that we can pick up on some of those issues um, and get some of the, the current practitioners thinking about how, how they can contribute and grow this archive going forward. Because I personally, I want it to be as famous as Mass Obs. Um, going forward in, in, in the next 20 years. And in, to do that, we need to build especially qualitative material. Um, and so, you know, AQR is obviously the, the wellspring, as it were, of, uh, of the qualitative material that we might have. I was interested in, um, we had a previous webinar, which was a rerun of the listening project, uh, in which we'd asked clients what they wanted of research, whether the qualitative research, and whether they thought it was dead in the water or not. Um, and the research that Ollie had done said that the amount of curated material, uh, which had previously been about 2%, had gone up a fair old amount. Now, I'd had conversations with, with clients and with researchers in the past 20 years or so with um, varying degrees of success because they have proved absolutely useless at archiving material. So are you finding that this is changing, that they're not only archiving it better, but that they are curating it better? I, I, I find examples of that, yeah, where, where clients are taking their heritage more seriously. Also, I think historically, clients had people like Peter and me in agencies who worked for them for a long period and we had their history. So we knew what they'd done before and we could say, oh, well, you've done this project and we learned from that. But of course, now people turn over so much more quickly and there's much more multiple use of agencies. So I, I, I think a lot of clients have become aware that they have a lot of historical market research that they haven't managed to put in a database that's easily accessible. And you do see, um, We've seen historically at conferences, clients like Unilever uh, and Coca-Cola telling you about how they were creating research databases um, for, for people to use across the business. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm, in, I'm very pleased to hear that that is happening more and going on. And it probably is very necessary because everybody has such short time scales these days, don't they? You know, nobody looks back more than 10 or uh, 12 months. Um, whereas in, with a lot of stuff, you need to look, you do need to look back further. You know, the world isn't so short term. Because I, I, I love you're, you're bursting. Could, could I add a point to that, which yeah. is I, I, I'm doing a lot of inquiries amongst companies and, and, and I'm finding quite often they are very keen to delay, donate things to the archive. This is particularly the case where a company has acquired a number of other companies. They tend to forget about and not be interested in what the companies they've acquired were doing over the years. And so if anyone has got um, material in their attic and so on, um, th that should be remembered. And th the one big company that I'm getting, I'm dealing with at present uh, is very keen that they've acquired about three or four other companies. They're very keen that the material from those companies they've acquired should be lodged with us, with the archive. And that's the sort of thing that's happening. Claire, I'm interested. Is there anything that A, you wouldn't accept and B, something that you're really keen to have? I think um, there is probably nothing that I wouldn't use as a source in some way. I think that as a historian, one of the most kind of gorgeous things that we get to do is to think creatively about um, how we can use materials from the past. And, you know, everything tells you something. It might not tell you the answers to the research questions that you set out with, but sometimes, you know, the weirdest material or the, or the ostensibly weirdest material can actually then make you reframe your whole research framework. I mean, we, you know, we know that researches can be um, full of, you know, different, you know, false starts and different alleys. And it's that's the gorgeousness of it. So You're obviously this, thinking of something in particular there. Well, actually, I was thinking about... Um, I was thinking about some of the material that, that Phyllis has shared with me. Um, you know, I was thinking particularly about, there was the report that she sent me um, uh, as a marketing um, research around continental quilts. Um, and I just loved it. I so loved it. And it just set in train a whole set of questions for me around bedroom culture, um, a, a, around work, domestic work, um, around the aesthetics of bedrooms um, and, and also even the very name of it, so that sense of difference, you know? So, so that's an example of something that, you know, I hadn't ever thought that I would be interested in, in, in continental quilts and lo and behold, I was. Yeah. Um, so we had, a, um, we had a lovely discussion about beds and the great bed of wear and, and when twin beds were fashionable. And I mean, it, it, it's astonishing where these things can lead you. And that was a study done because quilts in 1978 were being sold on price and the, the client wanted to see how they should be branded better. Um, but the quote, the verbatims were gorgeous, weren't they? They really were. Yeah. Because I mean, women were saving up, sorry, I keep interrupting. Women were saving up to buy them or getting them when they went to work because then they felt justified in spending the money and saving the time on the housework. It's an interesting title as well, a continental quilt. You know, in this era of Brexit, what would they have been called, I wonder? Um, we have had a couple of uh, questions in, if I can find them in a hurry. Um, one of which was from Simon, Simon Riley, who said, um, are, are there ways we commercial researchers can access the AMSR collection? How searchable, usable is it as a resource? It is free. Um, the, um, the, the, the trustees took the decision right at the beginning to digitise everything. So it is all completely digitised and it is free. So anybody can go in there and, and research it. Um, all archives need a little bit of um, easing into, 
Um, but if, if, you're, if you're a core researcher, I recommend you go in, go into the Cram collection, the Peter Cooper collection, and have a look for Continental Quilt or something like that, and you'll soon get the hang of how you get into it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you can use it to do background, to search for, for words or people or products. Um, I mean, I've got a, a PhD student who's doing a PhD, well, she's not mine, obviously I'm helping. Um, she's doing a PhD on kitchen appliances with special references to Kenwood, right? The design of Kenwood chefs. And, uh, and lo and behold, we had a, a, a study on, on kitchen appliances, which was done for Braun, but of course had Kenwood in there as a competitor or, or whatever, it was fantastic. So yes, go in and have a play. Have a look at the stories Peter talks about and then start looking, start searching for particular reports and you'll be surprised what you find. We've also got a, uh, a question in, well, rather a lot of questions in from, from Roddy Glenn, who I'll try and paraphrase in one simple one, which is, is, is the archive more social than commercial uh, when being taught? So is it of more interest to researchers, I mean, to academia, um, the, the commercial or the social side? Can I just take it and then Claire? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would have come into this thinking that um, people would have been interested in more social research than commercial research, but actually people like Claire like the commercial research, um, as far as I can tell more than, than anything else, because they, they're interested into the, the depth of it and they're interested in what were clients thinking at the time, what were the researchers thinking at the time, what were the audience thinking at the time, the users, and, and, and they come up with gold, I think, is, is what we can say. But I think, Claire, if you could comment on the, um, the social aspect versus commercial. No, I would agree. I mean, it's yeah. not a thing about um, accident, it almost using the source against the grain or using it coming into it from a sideways direction, that um, it's not always the, the source is generated through an explicit methodology that was trying to find the answer to your questions that are the most helpful sources. So, I mean, earlier on, Phyllis mentioned um, the study of luxury. We think of the extent to which taste, you know, changing taste can be studied through commercial research. Uh, it, it's just gorgeous. Whereas if you actually ask people explicitly social history questions about taste, they often deflect them a little bit. Uh, the same with social class. You know, commercial research is actually quite good at, at demonstrating the indicators of social class. Whereas when you ask people explicitly, what social class do you think you are? People get all a little bit flummoxed about that. Or, or, or there are all so many different um, things that are brought to bear on that question. So again, it gives you that lovely kind of sideways way into some of the big questions of, of modern British history. How many uh, students are you working with at any one time? Sorry, uh, for me, a question for me. Yeah. Um, so I usually have, I mean, I haven't actually been teaching this term because I'm on research leave to write a book. Um, but I usually, I have, I have, you know, four PhD students and then my undergraduates. Um, usually I mainly focus on teaching my third years um, who are writing dissertations. Um, and on topics, many of the topics that this archive would be particularly helpful for. So I teach students on a course on post-war Britain. So material about um, home. Um, about objects in the home, about relationships in the home, about changing women's changing work patterns um, and the implications of that for things like mealtimes. I mean, Phyllis introduced me to some material um, about changes in eating habits, um, so some work that had been done on that, um, which has all sorts of, you know, which is rooted in changing employment patterns amongst women, but has all sorts of knock-ons for the way family life um, is lived. Um, so yeah, and I, you know, some of the um, topics that Peter mentioned, um, I had a PhD student who did some, a wonderful thesis um, on corporal punishment, for example, and although he's already finished that project, he would have loved to have been, had access to the kind of material that you've been talking about. 
Can we pause before I go to you, Peter? We've, we've just got a question in from Sarah Pearson, who said, who, who decides what is valuable? Is it a bit random? And if there's a handover of data and that takes time, are there grants available? How many act, academics are actively interested or working with the archive? Early days. So Claire. It's very cool. I would say, I mean, in terms of British social 20th century uh, and 21st social history is, is a growing field. And it's one of the most, most, most dynamic fields, um, although I would say that, of course. The, there's a real growth area in um, histories of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, very, very um, contemporary history. And that's where I think that this desire to get the recent stuff um, and including the 21st century um, you know, online material um, will be really, really important. The randomness question is a really useful one because some of the material in, for example, the Mass Observation Archive, when you go in and get those boxes out, it's baffling why they decided to collect it. You know, they collect things like they make observations about how many times people in pubs tip their cigarettes, they have to get rid of the ash, or they, you know, they, they make all sorts of, of, of weird and, and random assessments of people's behavior in cinemas, um, which at the time they conceptualized as just getting everything, grasping everything, putting it in boxes. Now that is for me as a social historian, absolutely fantastic, because you don't know at the time what the historical questions are necessarily going to be because by its very nature, history reflects its present, the present in which it's written. Um, that said, there are of course limitations because archives, you know, physical archives um, can't hold everything. Um, and that's the beauty of the digital archive in that it has a little bit more capacity. There obviously are still restrictions, not least related to people's workloads, but I intend to be using this archive a lot when I'm teaching uh, my students, when I return to teaching next year and putting it alongside the mass observation material um, and just seeing how, how our students play with it and the, uh, the kinds of questions that emerge. Peter, I cut you off in your prime. Well, can I just add the point that um, I hope the people listening into this don't, aren't disdainful of looking at quantitative research as well as the qualitative because there's a lot of information from the, for instance, from the target group index from Maury's British Public Opinion over the last 40 odd years, which covers a massive range of issues and product ranges and service industries and so on. And that will add authority to any project you may be involved in if you know what's gone before. So we've got a couple of questions come in. Sorry for this. Um, one from Judith Wardle, who says, as someone who has come through all my old papers, I found it very difficult to work out what to send and how to send. Do you want briefs, proposals, successful and unsuccessful, handwritten and annotated notes, stimulus materials, conference papers? She could go on, but she's not. But, uh, am I right that we have asked um, that people who are intending to deposit material with the archive if they could first make a list of the things that they may be proposing to send, um, then we can tell them which ones broadly, you know, they, they can keep and which ones we will want. Is that right, Phyllis? Yeah, but, but on the other hand, we're, we're also anxious if they want to get rid of stuff, just put it in a box and send it to us. At the moment, you have to hand on, hang on to it because of COVID. We haven't got access to our office, but, um, but basically, Claire's absolutely right. We do not know what is going to be important in the future so the more, that we should take in as much as we possibly can. Yeah. So from Roddy, we get longhand report writing died sometime around 2000. Peter Cooper's collection in the archive bears witness to this. Qual presentations became PowerPoint or similar. Turnaround time pressures plus technology caused this. Reports were no longer freestanding and were sometimes only pictures i.e. you had to have been there. So we have left less useful ev evidence behind since that change. Have we become victims of our own mis 
shading or mishandling of time? That's a brilliant question. Um, and I'm working at the moment with um, modern, well, current agencies, I should say, because a PowerPoint report doesn't tell you everything and certainly not a good qualitative one doesn't. So what our proposal there is that we're going to collect more material um, and probably work with um, the quality people and, and the archive, the ISO archives that people create. So we'll take a report and the brief and the, and the guide and the notes, and then we'll have a, a, a complete um, content um, for, a, for a project. But it, it's something we're working on at the moment because he's quite right. It's possible that we've, uh, we've destroyed our own um, credibility. And I think that's probably why clients are curating as well, because there are some presentations that you look at later and you think, what the heck was, what did they say? I don't know. So would you consider going back to those who carried out the research and interviewing them? Or would you think that their memories were faulty over time? I hadn't thought of that, I must admit. I I've, done, I've done some background interviews. Um, I did one recently with John Bittleston, who sent us a 1963 report on cinema going in Greater London. And he had some great stories to tell. And I've just done some interviews with him on the background rather than about the research. Um, but no, we, we need to define something more, more structured that, um, that will give the Claire's of the future the, the story that they want. Because a lot of stuff now is social media. I mean, it's web scraping. I mean, how, you know, <laughs> That's very much equivalent to how many times did somebody tip their cigarette out in a pub, isn't it? You know, um, and uh, we're going to have, we're going to have to work out all of that. It's been in some ways it's been relatively straightforward collecting the paper reports, but it's getting more complicated going forward. And we'll proceed to get more complicated, I would have thought. Yes. Can I say we are now collecting material from the Worshipful Company of Marketers, their members where we will be getting, we hope, material on what they did with the research, how it affected their markets, um, rather than just the research itself. So I think that will sort of add a dim dimension to what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and another thing, we're, we're working also with business and marketing um, students and academics, and they, of course, want to know what the business problem or what the marketing problem was that was being addressed, which we don't necessarily have uh, explicitly stated because um, it wasn't so much our problem in the 1970s and 80s and 90s um, but that's what they're interested in so every every group of people every end user set that you bring in brings a slightly different perspective um, and it's it's just fascinating to to see how how people can value something that um, that we just treated as a you know standard output of our ordinary everyday lives it's marvelous so would you reckon, Claire, just to finish on this, that you're actually shaping the future of history as opposed to just studying what has gone before? I think archivists shape the future of history. I think by the, the choices that they make about what is archivable and what isn't. Um, so we never get, you know, even, even mass observation, wasn't able to collect everything in 1930s Bolton or 1940s London. Um, so there's always a shaping going on. Um, I think for the benefit of future historians, sort of collecting as much as is possible, you know, within whatever constraints we face is, 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 is the thing that, you know, I, I hope happens um, really, so that we're not entirely directing future historians we're giving them the resource to address the questions that they actually themselves come up with. And is there a, a profile and has it changed of the people who are st studying in this area? It's a very good question. The question of who the historian is. I think that there was a, a certainly a democratization um, of history as a, as a discipline with the expansion of universities in the 90s. Um, and into the 2000s, um, you know, expanding student numbers has had a knock on in terms of, of who went into academia, but also the study of history 
and historians exist beyond universities. I mean, history is such a vibrant area. You only have to listen to how many, see how many podcasts there are that are history themed um, out there. Um, that, you know, quite a modern way of presenting historical information, but there are loads of them and they're really popular. Um, or looking back a few years, the real success of something like Horrible Histories amongst children, which has brought up a whole generation, my own daughter included, who love history and can remember lots of historical facts um, because of the way little songs were made up about them. Um, so there's that huge sense of, of interest, I think, out there. And it's not just a passive interest. People want to be doing the history themselves. And again, uh, that's one of the benefits of having a free to access online archive, that you're not just catering to a, an audience of academic historians, you're catering to people more broadly in all sorts of areas who are interested in studying the past and developing their own histories of particular moments. Simon's chipped in again just before we go to say, is the archive collecting research films? And if we're going to archive something, what people are individually identifiable, do we need a specific permission from them before we film them? That the, that the film may then form part of an archive. I think, I think the permissions that, that people, I mean, it's something I definitely need to check up on. But I think the permissions that people are getting for filming focus groups and things like that, which I think is what he's talking about, um, are currently sufficient. But um, I've got GDPR specialists on, uh, on hand to, to check all of that out because, yes, it, obviously it's very important. Yeah, but just, just to echo what, 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 what Claire says, he, he, a research project is very much at a certain point in time, and it isn't subsequently edited by the victors or whatever, um, as, as a lot of history is. So it, it is perfect in its own little uh, little point in time that she refers to, and it, it is beautiful in its own right in that sense. Can, can I can I make one point that um, I've been telling people who are intending to contribute material that. Um, you know, if they're worried about client confidentiality issues, um, that usually, uh, if it's more than 20 years old, then there's not a problem. But if they have any doubts and worries about it, am I right, Phyllis, that we can give advice on yes. whether oh, yes. when that, 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 you know, on that, on that issue? Because they may yeah. be worried about that. Yeah. And Absolutely. Simon added that he was thinking more of ethnographic filming. Okay. That's a very good question. I, I'll take it on board and think about it. We'll get back to you, Simon. We haven't we haven't got a lot of video at the moment in the, um, but in the archive. We'll get more. I would have yeah, I know, I know. Well, that's one of the reasons why we've got to think very seriously about what what we're taking when we start collecting modern content. Well, hmm. unless we have any more questions, I, I think I'd probably call a halt um, round about now. I must do my housekeeping, which is to just talk about what else AQR has got coming up. Um, so there is a check-in on Wednesday at 10 o'clock, uh, where we welcome researchers to come and talk about face-to-face -face, um, and also talk to viewing facilities, uh, who obviously make face-to-face -face possible. Um, we've got three masterclasses coming up, or masterclasses coming up over three weeks in June which are very practical about steering businesses and teams into a hybrid world and covering, covering a whole load of topics. Um, we've got Quant for Qualis, which is fully booked, sadly, or happily. Um, and for young disruptors or the, the newer researchers, we've got a hackathon on the 16th of June at 5.30, which is all about um, a fun way to, to collaboratively shape the industry. So that should be a goodie. Um, so I would encourage everybody to come. But in the meantime, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you. Thank you very much. It's made for a, for a fascinating session. And I look forward to seeing what else comes out of, out of the archive and how you're using it. So thank you, one and all. Thank, thank you. you for having us. And bye-bye. Bye-bye.